what I wanted you to do is to get a sense of what's going on underneath the hood, because I want you to be doubtful. I want you to think a lot about which transcription factor binding profiles are there. I want you to recognize that there's a al conservation analysis step that's going on in most of these tools uh, to focus on regions of functional importance. I also want you to recognize that you can do the exact same things not for conserved regions, but you can do it for regions that show up in your chip analysis, for, for open accessible chromatin, or for uh, coactivator bound regions. So you can take different filters to focus in on regions of, of interest, not just phylogenetic footprinting. That said, the rest of the examples are still going to be using phylogenetic footprinting for the case. So the big question that we all have when we come in the door here is how can I look at my set of genes? How can I do something that lets me under interrogate, interpret, study which transcription factors might be acting on my set of genes. And the nice thing with sets of genes is you can now look for general patterns, and so you can get some, some benefits from having groups of genes, and you can sort of, the noise sort of levels out as you look at a set, and the signals may become a little more obvious. So I'm going to take you through the process, and then we're going to work on a, a set of genes, and that's going to be the, the most important piece to grab from, from this morning. So you'll remember that our, our core gain goal, sets of genes co-expressed, patterns that are abundant in one set and not so abundant in the other. So this is an overrepresentation analysis problem. And overrepresentation analysis is the same thing that you're doing yesterday with Go. We seek to determine if a set of co-expressed genes contains an overabundance of predicted binding sites for a known transcription factor. And we're going to use phylogenetic footprinting to reduce false positive predictions. So there's one difference from the Go analysis, which is that we have two styles of overrepresentation analysis that we can do. So one type of overrepresentation analysis is the same, which is are there more annotated genes with transcription factor binding sites in the foreground set than in the background set? <coughs> exactly the same. Are there more genes with the Go term X in this set than that set? The rate of the prediction, it's the number of predictions here, the number of genes with predictions higher than there. But in transcription factor binding sites, we also have the added possibility that are the frequency of binding sites higher than in the background. So are there more binding sites on average per nucleotide in this set of genes than on average in the background? So you're looking for uh, a difference in rate here, you're looking for a difference in gene annotations there. Both are relevant for transcription factor binding site studies, and so most tools will give you both statistics. So there's two, uh, two scores. So the first method is, as you heard, the Fisher, Fisher calculations, which is the looking at the genes with the more binding, uh, which set has more genes with binding sites. And then there's the binomial test looking at the Z scores for determining the number of occurrences and seeing if the, the rate of predictions is higher in the sequences in the first set than the second. Is that clear? That you have two scores? The Z scores are for the uh, number of occurrences, and Fisher scores are for the number of genes with binding sites. Okay. So this is, uh, I'm going to talk to you about a system called Opossum that might lab built. built. Uh, there's another system called CONFAC that does the same sort of analysis. And there's a new one, and I forget its name, but I'll try to put its link up so that you have that one as well to, to point to. Um, you start with giving, pasting in a list of genes. So you have to give it a set of genes that you think are co-expressed or are constitute some sort of functional grouping. The system calls to the uh, genome database. In this case, it uses Ensemble because that's computationally friendlier than in UCSC. Uh, calls to Ensemble and gets back the um, orthologous genome sequences with orthology as defined by Ensemble. Um, it makes an alignment of those sequences using the ORCA aligner, which was in that tool that you just tried. Uh, it uses the JASPER database to make predictions of transcription factor binding sites within those sequences. So the opossum system is human and mouse, um, and in fact, confact is human and mouse, and I'm not sure 
about others. But opossum, as I'll show you, there are actually, there's a yeast tool, there's a worm tool, uh, and there's the human and mouse tool. Um, if you're in flies, you're out of luck. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but you can do some of these things uh, directly by just performing the analysis on the sequences and doing the, the representation analysis. Um, but it is because it's so computationally heavy, these, you do need pre-computed things to do this efficiently on web browsers. And so the web tools tend to be for the uh, relatively restricted organisms. Um, the significance calculations are performed in R, and then you get back a list of predicted mediating transcription factors. So these were just a couple of examples of very clean data sets. So these are sets where we know co-regulation is occurring. Each of these genes is, is regulated by a, one of a group of transcription factors, one or more of a group. So the first side over here is looking at a group of skeletal muscle genes. These are genes that are turned on when C2, C12 myoblasts differentiate into myotubes. Um, and what we see in this gene list, it was 23 genes were submitted. It successfully analyzed only 16 of those. So that means that a portion of them, there wasn't, maybe there wasn't a defined ortholog, maybe they wasn't able to make an alignment of the orthologous sequence, but it was able to, to perform the analysis with 16. Um, and it comes back and says that the uh, transcription factor binding profiles for the SRF factor, and the MF2 factor, the MyoD family, the TEF1 family are all up there at the top, which are the ones that you would expect. And the CMIB actually, since that time, has been shown to be a repressor active on these genes uh, prior to the differentiation. So the top five hits were all reasonable hits in the overrepresentation analysis, and then things get a little squishy. Uh, similarly, this was a hepatocyte set, 20 were input, it successfully analyzed 12, comes up with the HNF1 <coughs> transcription factor at the top, HNF3 beta. Um, now, one thing that's particularly <coughs> problematic uh, for overrepresentation analysis, and in fact all sorts of issues around transcription factor binding site analysis, is interpreting which transcription factor is actually acting. So, this free act is a 4 k transcription factor profile. It's not one that's expressed or active in the liver, but the 4 k transcription factors all more or less bind to the same DNA sequence. Helix loop helix factors often bind to more or less the same DNA sequence. The MADS box factors, SRF and F2, both have very similar A-rich binding sequences. So some families of transcription factors, uh, one profile may be representative of the binding sites for a vast number of members of that family. Can I ask a question? Yep. Why, uh, so on what basis are those particular ones that red arrow mark and not These red were red known uh, reference transcription factors that were known to regulate this gene set. This particular gene set. This particular gene set. So this is hand drawn for your benefit. Um, this is just interpreting scores, and so this was a few different reference collections and seeing what the, the Z-score uh, threshold and the Fisher p-value thresholds might be for sort of standard gene sets. As Quaid mentioned yesterday, these scores are dependent on the number of, of genes analyzed. So if you analyze more genes, you might get uh, consistently higher uh, or more significant uh, scores. Uh, so these sets tended to be analyzed with on the order of 30 to 40 uh, genes in the group. And so these empirically determined suggestions for, for thresholds are based on that size. Larger gene sets will be different. Uh, but this was just to show you that you do get some separation in the NFCAP B reference collection. You found NFCAP B profiles, liver profiles, you found those, and the muscle profiles, you found them being distinguished from most of the rest of the group. Uh, this is a Sort of a more real-world data set, this was some uh, SAGE data that was linked to CMIC overexpression. Uh, and you see that in this particular experiment, uh, genes, the genes that came up as being differentially expressed had signatures for, for a MIC-MAX profile, a MAX profile, a MIC profile in this list. And so you again see this also this idea of correlated uh, profiles coming out as sets in, in the group. Uh, the opossum system that you're going to use uh, reports Z scores, which essentially is how many standard deviations away from the norm are you. 
And the Fisher score, as we you learned about yesterday, it doesn't report uh, FDR. Uh, we probably will do that in the next iteration. So it's a, FDR would be a good thing here, but it's not given. Okay, so coming back to this point that most, uh, in many structurally related families of transcription factors, they bind to similar sequences. So these are binding profiles for different members of the ETS transcription factor family. You'll notice that there's basically a GGAA pattern that's predominant in the family. This is GGAA on the reverse strand. So that one's flipped. Um, and so the fact that you hit an ETS profile as being overrepresented doesn't really tell you which member of the ETS family is acting on the gene. And so the interpretation is harder because you need to then figure out which member of the family is there. This doesn't uniformly apply to all families. So the zinc finger transcription factor family is the biggest and most notable exception. And that's each member of the zinc finger family pretty much has its own binding specificity. The zinc finger family also constitutes about half of all DNA binding transcription factors. Uh, and most of them have not been profiled. So we're going to come back a little bit later and talk about what you might do to get to th those cases where you have a transcription factor that's not profiled. That said, if you hit on an ETS profile, or you hit on a helix helix profile, or you hit on um, uh, certain other SOX profiles, uh, you have an indication that the member of the family might be there, but you don't know which member to emphasize. So how can you, what can you do in those cases? Um, well, one thing you can do is you can download the, the list of all the members of that family. There's a tool called TFCAD. There's another one called DBD. Uh, which have lists of all the members of these families, you can then take those lists and you can say, go to a tool like TopGene, which is a, a tool originally designed for uh, uh, genome association studies uh, or linkage studies, where you're trying to pick a gene from amongst a set of genes that might be more closely involved in a process. So you'd say, okay, I think my gene has something to do with my system that I'm studying has something to do with muscle or has something to do with bladder cancer or something to do with the like. Um, top gene then would prioritize these based on the literature, uh, largely, uh, and see which members of these families, which mem which members of this family, uh, have a connection to the term that you're interested in. I'm not going to go further on this point uh, today, but it's it is an issue, uh, and it's not there's not a perfectly clean solution. So, what have we learned here? That there are tools to interrogate the meaning of clusters of co-expressed genes. Um, so I didn't, I, the slide got removed for this one. So let me comment on this point. Um, lots of us do gene, large genomics projects. And we do them for a variety of reasons. And we do our expression profiling in a different variety of situations. <coughs> Most of the time, we don't design our experiments to interrogate the regulation of a set of genes. So when you are doing an experiment, if you are looking at um, two transgenic animals, and one of the animals has missing a gene, and you're taking some cell out of them and comparing the two. You have a lifetime of differentiation and process that's been affected. So you're looking not just at primary effects of your, your gene, but you're looking at secondary, and tertiary, and quaternary effects that are acting together. And so any gene expression signature you see is unlikely to represent one transcription factor or one set of transcription factors. It's going to represent lots of processes that have occurred over time. Likewise, if you're looking at 24-hour steps in cell culture, you've had many events that have happened over those 24 hours. And you're going to have a very complex set of genes uh, responding. So what you want for promoter analysis is you want experiments that precisely pin down sets of genes that are likely part of, part of the same response. So the ones that work well tends to be experiments where you're looking at a differentiation. You have a, a cell that you've looked at at several time points on close <coughs> steps over a differentiation process, meaning half hour or hour steps uh, along the way. Or you have a genetic system where you can do a, um, a transient knockdown or a transient change, a, a inducible change in the system so that you can see a direct effect of one thing. Or a chemical system where you can put an inhibitor in and you can look at the immediate effects of that inhibitor. On, uh, on the process. So these types of experiments tend to be more favorable to regulatory sequence analysis than long or time points or big developmental curves. Question? How do you choose when to look at it? Or do you always need to do this over time? 
you, uh, in most cases, you have to, unless there's something in the literature, uh, you're going to need some sort of time course analysis to see when things are happening along the way. So, do trends of look at trends and look at groups. And so, largely what you're looking for is some <coughs> pattern of expression, some set of genes that are following that pattern pretty closely. Uh, and you'd rather have it focused on a small group that is doing something very close together than on a large group of genes that are re probably representing lots of different events. Yeah, so the nice thing with this overrepresentation analysis is it's, compared to some of the other methods, it's much more tolerant of noise than, than the others. And so you can have, you can even have multiple responses in the same system, and oftentimes you'll still pick out a signature uh, within it. My experience is that if you add 50% noise to a gene set, so you randomly toss in genes to constitute 50% of the set, you can oftentimes still pull out the pattern, but not much more than that. So that's sort of the upper limits. Um, and of course, it depends on how clean your first set was. Um, so 50% when you had a pretty clean starting set. But when you're looking at tertiary and, and uh, later effects, uh, your gene, any individual regulatory program may only constitute 15%. That. So it can be quite difficult. And what would be the minimum number of genes that you should be looking at? So my experience is if you have less than 10 genes, uh, you're never going to get anywhere with this. So less than 10, there's really no point in bothering. Um, and generally, the sweet spot seems to be somewhere between 20 and 50. So if you have 20 to 50 genes that seem to be part of the same regulatory program, there's been a well done expression study or chemical inhibitions, and you get 20 or 50 genes that are constitute a real cluster in your data, then this method will usually work. Can you comment on, on the sites like that, the entire uh, the sample of sites that are, uh, that are doing uh, it? I don't think they use the genetic analysis, but they're yeah, regular. Um, so I, I'd have to look to make sure that I'm on the same page. Um, there have been lots of experiments done recently to look at sequences that are conserved over long evolutionary periods. Uh, there have been lots of experiments to uh, take, for instance, FUGU uh, conserved regions, uh, human FUGU conserved regions, and test them and put them into databases. Um, but these are sort of gene-specific ones rather than and interpreting sets of genes. So I have to look. Um, let's, let's do that during the, the lab, and I'll come and look at it and see what, which one's there. Um, OK, and the, the, the final point was that the identity of the mediating tr transcription factor may not match the name that comes up on the profile that was used to do it, but the class may be more relevant to you. So another way that uh, a lot of people are finding it works uh, reasonably well on this last point is to look to see which transcription factors of a class are actually expressed in your cell of interest. So oftentimes in your expression data, if you're emphasizing, you know, I see an ETS signature, the obvious question is, is there an ETS factor that is expressed in an interesting way in my system? And that might be a, a good one to start on. OK. So I think we've had lots of questions. So this is the big lab. Did I hear a question? Okay, this is the big lab. So what I'm going to do is we're going to, I'm going to run one set through Opossum for you. Uh, and then hopefully if you've got a data set that is uh, suitable, uh, you can go ahead and try your, your gene list out in the system and see how it goes and you can begin to look at it. So I'm going to, um, to take you to that point uh, and walk you through one set. So just a minute. Okay, so I'm back to the wiki workshop page, and you'll see in there there's a link to the opossum system, it's sort of shown as an 11 with a double arrow. So go ahead and uh, open up opossum, come over to the opossum page. You'll see that there's four different variants of opossum. There's a human single site analysis, which looks for single overrepresented uh, binding site pat patterns. There's the combinatorial site analysis 
This is computationally extremely slow. So we're not going to do that today. Um, and you should be, but you're welcome to try it out uh, later if you're interested in it. It looks for how, are there overrepresented combinations that come up. Um, there's a worm one. I didn't double check the worm one for functionality today, so I, it, hopefully it's up and running. And the yeast one should be working. I did check that. Um, so we're going to focus on the human single site analysis. <coughs> so go ahead and click enter on human single site analysis. I can find my mouse. Okay, so you're going to um, give it a list of genes. This is human or mouse. You're going to give it a, an indication of what the gene ID type is. Ensemble, Hugo or BMGI gene symbols, RefSeq IDs, or entree genes. <coughs> and you're going to paste in a list of genes. So let's do this a couple ways first. First, we'll just take the sample gene set, just to give you a thing. So just click on Use Sample Genes. And step two is to choose your profiles. So it's using Jasper. Same idea as you had in the ORCA TK exercise where you can restrict it. We'll just take defaults for now. And then you can change your parameters. This is the same idea as before. The level of conservation, sort of the top 10% of conserved regions. The matrix match threshold that we've talked about. The number of results to display. Um, Let's give it a little more than 10. Maybe we'll take 20. And the sort results by it. reports both the Z-score and the Fisher score, but you can sort the list in either way. So I'll just leave it as the default. I'll hit Submit. See if we can kill the server. So what it's done is it's got a pre-computed set of alignments, pre-computed set of transcription factor binding site scores. It takes the criteria that you've given it, and it uh, goes through, counts how many binding sites are in your gene, and compares that to um, the background. And the background is assumed to be the whole genome in this run. It's going to take a minute. Now, there is an advanced version where you can um, go in and plug in your own background. So that is a, an alternative. If you have an array list, uh, there is a one that will run with the array list as its background set. You still have to put in two different uh, sets, right? One for the background and one for your... So if you want to define the background, you have to give it a background set. It will run in default with the all genes for which there is a mapped ortho ortholog between human and mouse. So it's... So here it's critical to the ID, it's critical to find, like, choosing the right ID and standard is very... Interesting. It's not a very smart system, so it's, uh, you pretty much have to tell it the right ID. Yeah, so it's based on ensemble underneath. So if you want, if you have an ensemble ID, that's your best one because you know it's not going to have mapping problems along the way. Uh, but it will, it works with what ensemble has mapped for the, the gene symbols and the like. So while we're waiting for this to come through, the custom analysis tab there, which you can see on the top of the screen, is where you can go to set up your uh, your own background set. You can also adjust some of the more more of the par parameters more uh, loosely. You can do this uh, for those of you who are computer programmers. You can do this uh, directly through an API. So you can talk, call into the database and do this programmatically, and not have to go through the web interface if you want to do it lots. Um, and if you want to, you can take the whole pre-computed database of all the binding sites and all the conserved regions, and take that away and work with it. And this poor server is not happy with all of us hitting it at the same time. <coughs> so while, while that's chewing, I'm going to go ahead and 
set up to do one more task on it. So I'm going to open a separate opossum window and do another single site analysis run. But this time I'm going to use my own gene list. So in the data files, I've got a gene list, mod 3 gene list down here. And I'm just going to take that set and run it through. So in this case, it's a gene symbol list rather than an ensemble list. So I'll take the Hugo gene symbols. I'll paste them in. <laughs> yep, that's the one I'm running. If you have your own gene list and it's a human mouse, you can try that out uh, in here. Or if you have a yeast or a worm set, you can go to the corresponding uh, uh, opossum system for that species. And I'm just going to take all default parameters. And as long as we're killing the server, let's, let's finish it off and have it do that. OK. Say that again. So, so the question is, can we just examine the gene list for transcription factors? So it depends on your experiment. So sometimes the transcription factors that are regulating your set are already there, uh, so they may not be highly differentially expressed in your your set. Uh, sometimes. You're interested in potential silencing that goes on of your gene set, so you might see signatures of genes that are turned on later in the process that would show up in your set. So it's not a guarantee. Uh, but in general, it's interesting to note which transcription factors are in your list. And so there are um, archives of lists of all the DNA binding transcription factors. And so there's two major ones. So there's DBD, <coughs> which is the DNA binding domain database, I guess it's called, uh, which is maintained at, uh, uh, I think it's at the EBI. So if you look at DBD and transcription factor, you'll get it. And they have lists of all the transcription factor genes for different species. And then there's one called TFCAT, uh, which has human mouse transcription factors. So here's the analysis results for the, the second one. first one hasn't come through yet, so that's interesting. Um, so this was the mod 3 gene list. What you see is the list of genes that it successfully analyzed from that list. So in this case, they all, all worked. There's usually be some in your list that don't. Um, and then it gives you the list of the uh, profile that comes up as being overrepresented. Um, the uh, TF class, the TF class supergroup, which you don't really uh, need to know about. The information content, which is measure how strong the pattern is in that profile. Then you get the number of genes in the background that had that binding site. And you get the number of genes in the background that didn't have that binding site. You get the number of genes in your list that had that binding site. And the uh, number of genes in your list that did not have the binding site. And then you see um, the total number of background hits. And then you see the rate. So that's the how many hits per nucleotide uh, were there. And you see the rate in your targets list, your foreground list. Then you see your z-score and your Fisher score. So what you'll see here is that this list is um, enriched for these homeodomain transcription factors. So there seems to be a signature there that there's a potential role of homeodomain transcription factors. So you can pop up the pattern of the binding site by clicking on the name of the transcription factor. So there's the uh, first one of the homeodomain list. And then you can pop up the next one. And you'll notice that they all have this TAAT pattern at the core of it. Another one, 
So they do look very similar. <coughs> so you begin to think that there might be some signature of a homeo domain transcription factor. Top of the list was this HMG transcription factor. Looks a little bit different. Um, so this sort of analysis would lead you to think, well, maybe there's something to do with the, um, the homeo domain transcription factors in regulating my list. Maybe I should take a closer look and go see if there's a homeo domain transcription factor that might be consistent with the, the biology that I'm working on. Um, I'm going to, I think, kill this analysis. Is there a Z-score, a cutoff of Z-score that below? So, these ones, these scores are very high. So these are extremely high Z-scores. Uh, probably because this list is a little bit tailored for uh, demonstration purposes. Uh, so, and again, these scores, um, both the Fisher scores and the Z scores, uh, you'll get, depending on the size of your list, you'll uh, have different interpretations. So the general default is if you're looking at 20 to 50 genes, that Z scores over 10 and Fisher scores under uh, 0.01 are, are interesting. Uh, <coughs> sure. It's also in that in the figure with the uh, the empirical plot with the dashed lines on it. So a few slides back. So just <coughs> it up here. So that one, uh, in general, there seems to be a pretty good distinction from the sort of background rate of predictions and the, the known regulators that seems to fall above 10 for the Z-scores and below uh, 0.01 uh, for the Fisher scores. But these are sets of sort of 20 to 50 size. Yeah. yeah, we don't transform it because there's some issues around the distribution that we're not completely comfortable with. And so we weren't quite ready to convert it to a p-value to it. So we use it as a scoring step, but we didn't want to convey a sense of p-value to that particular score. Whereas the Fisher, we feel a little more comfortable with calling it a p-value. It's not corrected, the Fisher p-value, so there's no Bonferroni correction or anything else in that. Okay. So hopefully you're in there and giving it a try. So I'm going to give you... Um, uh, let me give you about 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, to go ahead and, and try using opossum on your own set or uh, use it on your favorite. Um, and if you, uh, the alternative would be to go in and look at your favorite gene and, and try it out in some of the promoter analysis tools. So take about 10 or 15 minutes and work away. I'll be around the room, so feel free to grab me. And uh, I'm going to point you, sort of try to give you the briefest of introductions to how those things work. Uh, it's a good thing Quaid's not in the room because he'd probably object to some of my terminology that I'm going to use here, but uh, I'll give you the main idea about what's going on. So, same idea, set of genes, uh, come out with the patterns. And this is why I'm normally on a Mac and not a PC because it just ate my slide. Um, okay, so there's loosely two ways of doing this. One way is around strings and one way is around uh, quantitative matrices. So, uh, same as before, you can think about a consensus sequence as being looked for versus matrix profiles of patterns. I admit to a very strong bias to the, the latter because I'm interested in quantitative patterns and I think strings don't get me very far. That said, strings have been enormously successful in yeast and other in prokaryotes where you have short patterns to look for. So if you're in those worlds, um, string based methods are probably the quickest. The string based method of choice right now uh, seems to be Weeder. So that's the one that's been performing well on people's hands. There's a link on the wiki to the Weeder system. Um, and the profile based methods, there's a variety of them. Uh, we're going to point to meme, a particularly convenient example. Meme's an oldie but a goodie. It's been around for a long, long time. Uh, and it's going to, it uses a slightly different method than the one I'm going to describe to you, but they're, they're related. So I'm going to give you sort of overviews of both of those approaches in simple terms. And I want you to recognize that there's lots of extra doodads that the, uh, that the tools put in place. So string-based methods are essentially the same as what we've been doing. 
instead of looking at transcription factor binding sites or looking at ghost terms, string-based methods look at the string. And so they count how many times does each pattern, each possible pattern, occur in your gene set versus the background. And so what it does is it determines our finding X occurrences of a word in a set of sequences significant given the background sequence characters. Exactly the same problem on Go and on Motifs. And so the way this works is it makes a lookup table. So for each possible pattern, it says how, many, how frequently does that pattern occur in the background set. So for instance, the pattern AAA, CC, TTT occurs 456 times in the promoters that have been analyzed in the background. And the pattern TT, TT, TTT uh, occurs 57,788 times. And so now when you count, when you take your foreground set of genes, your group of tests that you're analyzing, and you say, okay, I found a bunch of T's as a significant, and you compare it to finding 57,788 of them in the background, you determine that uh, that's not significant. Of course, the same number of AAAs, CCs, TTTs would be discovered. Exactly the same method. It's just doing it for every possible strain. Now, in the old days, I used to say, well, it works for strings of length 6, but computers are slow. Now I can say it's working on strings of about length 12 with degeneracy, and computers are no longer the problem. So these methods are fast. They look not just for single strings like this, but they use IE path degeneracy codes to look for, for how frequent the, each degeneracy is. And so they're doing very elegant analyses for, for consensus sequences. So that's uh, but how do they know what to look for? They, 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 they just, they just make every single string and they look to see if they're across your whole sequence. So when I say it works well for these particular periods, that's because you only need to analyze a thousand base pairs or so per gene that you're working with. As soon as you plug in and work on uh, something large, you can imagine it takes the computer a long time. Why is that upper bound of a 12? Or where, where do you pull that figure from? So that once you get much over 12, uh, the computer processing time takes forever. This okay, is so an exponential explosion. You're limited by RAM. You're limited by cycles. So by, by speed of the computers. So not RAM, this isn't actually much memory. But the problem is that when you consider all possible combinations, uh, you have a factor of 4. So it's an exponential increase uh, factor of 4. And by the time you're getting up to about 4 to the 13th power, uh, it's getting to take a long time. So 4 to the 12th power seems to be working reasonably well. Uh, and I'm sure supercomputers that some people have probably are doing a little bit better, but, it's, uh, but it does become a problem. Okay, so it's just doing the same thing. It's got giving a Z score, same statistic that you learned yesterday, uh, correcting for the variance uh, in the mean and giving you a, a score back. So there are some limitations on word length, not so much as it used to be. Um, I have my personal bias that I'm not real fond of degeneracy codes because I don't think they quantitatively, quantitatively reflect the patterns that are there. Um, the string-based method, though, for microRNA target sequences has been extremely successful. So the microRNA is much more favorable to the string-based method. So if you have a bunch of UTR sequences you want to analyze, I'd go use a string-based method uh, for you. Uh, the microRNAs are, don't have so much variability in their, their target site, so they tend to have uh, the same nucleotide pattern. So, so a string-based method is very much in line with the, the nature of hybridization of two strands of nucleic acids. Um, but I'm biased to promoters and transcriptions, so I'm going to be biased towards a slightly different way of doing things. Uh, so this was just a, a reference to my um, Okay, so now we're going to talk about how to look for patterns that are profiles or matrices. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to what's called the Gibbs sampling based procedure for pattern discovery. Gibbs sampling applies to lots of different statistical problems, but for motif discovery, there's sort of a specific way of doing this. And I'm going to hide a lot of layers of complexity here, and I'm going to give you the essence of what it's doing. 
So same idea, we want to find a, a, a local alignment. So a matrix can be thought of as a, a representation of an alignment. So you're going to find a local alignment of width x that maximizes the information content, or actually a parameter called the map score in most cases. Um, and there's a few different ways of doing this. And we've talked about being motivated for this. We're going to do this in a, a probabilistic framework for the example that I'm going to give you, which means that you're going to largely get different answers every time you run the program. So there's a stochastic element to it. Um, but most of those patterns should be, end up being similar. And what this ultimately means is we're going to guess our way to the right find. Anybody ready for some guessing? <laughs> okay. Let's see if I've got the next. So this is not my favorite slide for this. Let's see. Okay. Here we go. So here's the sampling in a nutshell. You can use some of the other slides for more information. So the first thing we do is we guess where the body is. There's nothing complex. I really mean that. We guess. We just say the sites are located here, 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 and here, and here. So chances of getting the right ones? Pretty much zero. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's, let's, we might wiggle them a little bit. We're going to make an alignment out of those sites. Uh, we'll make a profile. The profile is going to be a bunch of noise. But now what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's throw out that guess. We'll, we'll actually throw that one out from the profile, too. So let's keep this sequence out. And now let's try to figure out where the pattern is located in this particular sequence. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to take this profile and we're going to score each position for its match to the pattern that we already have. So most of the time, this is meaningless. We've got a noisy profile. It doesn't mean anything. But what happens is once you get one sort of relevant pattern, it's going to bias you to finding a pattern similar to the one of the sequences in your set. It's not going to be a very strong bias, but it's going to bias you a little bit. <coughs> and once you get two patterns in that profile, two of the sequences contributing to that profile, it's going to bias you even more. And so what happens is very quickly it starts zooming in on the pattern that is relevant. So in this case, in a, a true Gibbs sampling methodology, you usually guess which one, which position in proportion to the scores. In a EM method like the mean, you will take the maximum position. So you will take the best scoring site than guessing in proportion to the height. So now you replace that, you place it under that high peak, and you repeat that process over and over and over and over again, maybe 5,000 times, uh, until the system doesn't really change the sites they're looking at. So it stabilizes on a set of sequences, or it stabilizes at least on the quality of the pattern that it has. Now, there's a problem with this. And the problem with this is at the beginning of this first stochastic step, you could get yourself caught on a pattern that's made. It's a pattern, but it's not the best pattern that's in the set. And so what you want to do is not only do you want to cycle this many times through here, but you want to repeat the process from the beginning many thousands of times. And so you let the computer do the guessing 5,000 times, and you let do the searching 5,000 times for each guess, and you report back perhaps the strongest pattern, or the few strongest patterns that emerge from that analysis. And the strongest patterns essentially measure how, how striking is the pattern conservation that you see. So that's what most of the pattern discovery tools are doing uh, underneath the hood. And they, by and large, uh, are statistically proven that if you do this enough times, you will find the optimal pattern. Are there bounds in terms of length and sequence you're competing in? So the, um, there is issues around the perception of the pattern that's there. So technically, the programs will tolerate oftentimes quite long sequences. But you have to recognize that you're trying to find some pattern against a background of noise. And so the more sequence you give it, the more noise you're giving it, and the more patterns that will arise by chance. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's take just a simple case. Just give it a bunch of binding sites. This case from that too, transcription factor. And we'll let the pattern discovery procedure apply on this. It should do this relatively easily. There's nothing else there. It's going to find the right pattern. And now we'll tack on some randomly selected promoter sequences to the edges of this. We'll do more and more 
until you lose your ability to recover the pattern that you're looking for. So the question is, how much sequence can you add onto the edges of these until you lose your capacity to pull up the pattern that you want? It depends on the information content of the pattern you're looking for. So a very strong pattern, you can add a lot more sequence to the edges. A very weak pattern, it's going to disappear with relatively short sequence. So you have the slides, so it's not really much of a guessing game. Uh, most people think that you're going to be able to pull these patterns out for much more sequence than you can. The reality, MEF2 is a strong pattern. By the time you've added 500 base pairs of flanking sequence, you've lost your ability to recover MEF2 relative to the patterns that are found in random pools. So blue is with the binding site present, pink is with a random uh, set of sequences. And what you see is up to 100 base pairs are basically always hitting the right site. Then it starts putting in uh, some less good sites, and by the time you have 500 base pairs of flanking sequence, you're not recovering the pattern of the background at all. So that's pretty limited. You have to be pretty convinced of what you're working on. It works pretty well for chip seek regions, because those regions tend to be relatively short. If you have a couple hundred base pairs in chip seek, uh, it works okay. Another thing that helps in transcription factor finding sites is oftentimes there's multiple sites for the same transcription factor in the sequence, so the patterns are a little stronger uh, relative to this one, where there's only one. Per sequence, but it is not great. So that said, uh, oftentimes people want to give it a try, uh, so I give you a set to give it a try with so that you can go to, to do it. Uh, one thing I'll mention just quickly, um, this score on the, the y-axis sort of hidden away from you is the similarity score between the profile that's recovered by the pattern discovery program tool and the known profile. And so this is just like doing a blast analysis to help you recover some pattern you'd like to see what patterns in the database of patterns are most similar to the one you recovered. And so um, there are a couple different tools for doing this type of comparison. The one that I've recommended to you is called TomTom. Tom. Uh, and TomTom Tom is part of the mean package. So you, that you can go to TomTom Tom with a frequency matrix, paste it in, and we'll do a comparison against the Jasper database to see which profiles look like the pattern. So if you want to give it a try, um, it does take Meme a little while to, uh, to come back, so let's just pop it up quickly here. So in your um, in the wiki, there is a um, gene list sequences. So I've pulled out the promoter sequences. So for your set, if you want to try it out on your own set, you need to go to Biomart. And you need to use it to pull up, uh, for instance, 500 base pairs or 1,000 base pairs adjacent to your genes of interest. So Based if you, on what you said, if you have 1,000, the chances you get is five <coughs> um, Depends on the strength of the pattern, and it depends on the uh, number of occurrences of the pattern. So it makes sense to like 500. 500, 500 is, I'd recommend 500. Than, uh, I'd probably try 500 as the first pass. Um, so here's the. Uh, Here's some gene lists. Here's some sequences. I've given you one if you want to just try to do it on a set. Just copy that. And then in the wiki, there's a link to meme. To me, a me, meme. And you can go off to there. There's also a link to Weeder if you want to try it out in Weeder. And so meme has a bunch of tools. We're just going to use start with meme to do our analysis. It's a, kind of a slow process, so it's an email-based response. You paste your, uh, you can either upload a file or you can just paste in your sequences. And then there's some settings, and generally I'm going to say just go ahead and take the defaults, but I'll try to tell you what they're doing. These ones are looking at how, how many um, occurrences of the pattern do you expect to find. <coughs> so one per sequence, it will require that there be at least one occurrence of the pattern in every sequence it analyzes. Zero or one says it's okay for a sequence not to have the pattern, uh, and any number of repetitions. Uh, sorry. For meme was originally designed for protein analysis, and so protein motifs tend to be longer. Uh, so if, if you don't change the setting, it will work pretty hard to look for long patterns. But for binding sites, you can probably limit yourself to something on the order of 15 long, and you'll it'll recover most of what's there. And then down below, 
You could give it a name so that if you're doing multiple things, you know which one you're getting. Okay. You can um, put in your own background model. <coughs> this is beyond what you're going to want to do, but you can uh, try to correct for the background characteristics. And then you uh, uh, sort of choose how many binding sites it will look for within you. It will just take defaults. So you start the search. And it goes off and works on it, and it will send you an email when it comes back. So <coughs> I'm just going to um, do one more thing with Meme while this is working. Go back to the wiki page, which is um, take a profile that's come back. Actually, this is a stat binding profile. So this is a position frequency matrix, ACGT going down, and I'm just going to compare that to the database of profiles so you can see what you can do to compare uh, once you get a profile back in your meme report. So back to meme, and the meme suite is the TomTom Tom program. So you go to TomTom, Tom, you paste your pattern into the box, it's comparing it against Jasper. You can choose different uh, uh, scoring systems for using. Um, I have a personal preference for that one, but uh, you can do it with Pearson correlation coefficient, which is what most people do. And then you can uh, start your search, and it runs the comparison. And so this is the pattern I gave it uh, down on the bottom. And this is the Jasper profile pattern that it found was most similar to the profile. So this was a, um, a stat, uh, supposedly a stat transcription factor binding profile, though I didn't confirm that, uh, so it could be an annotation problem. And this is a profile in Jasper uh, called MA0051, which is uh, labeled IRF2. So if you, would there be multiple? You can. So this is um, this is reporting all motif matches with a score better than 0.5 on their scoring system. So it's it's a thresholded procedure. And I think I didn't notice in the entry parameter if there was a chance to control that that score. But if there's more than one hit, it'll it'll give it. So let's just click back here and see if there was a threshold to give on that. It doesn't look like it, so you pretty much get their threshold for, <coughs> for what it is to report. Okay. So anyway, when you have a profile that comes up, uh, if it's from your chip data and you want to see what's coming up, or if it's from a promoter analysis like, like this, TomTom's a convenient tool for comparing to the database and seeing if it looks like anything else. So go ahead and give that a try. Uh, if you've got a, a gene set, uh, try to pull out the promoter sequences and uh, feed it into uh, Meme, and you can try Weeder as well if you want to. Um, I think I'll go around helping people, people rather than do a Weeder example, but just to point you in the right direction, this is the Weeder one, and you want Weeder, Weeder version 1.3, which is sort of midway down the page. Um, on the way, and then you go here to start inputting data. And it's basically the same input, fast A sequences, choose a species because Weeder is a string-based method, so it has to have a pre-computed database of uh, counts to work with, and then let it uh, chew away, and it will set up and send you an email. Okay, So that's pretty much it for what I was trying to walk you through. I hope you're having some success with the promoter analysis, and I'll try to hang out around here for a while uh, during the lunch break so that people have questions, uh, come grab me, uh, and I'm happy to help you all out.